Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Ayelet. I'm the uh, Events and Programs Manager at the Burnaby Board of Trade. Um, before we start, I, I would like to take a moment to recognize that we are on the traditional homeland of the Hankominim and Skohomish speaking people, and we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to hold a meeting in this territory. So in today's event, Angie Dosange of Marwick Marketing will be sharing practical tips and tools business owners can use in their search marketing and social media marketing efforts to stand out from their competition. She will also discuss the importance of targeting and knowing your customer. So before we start, I'd like to take uh, a moment to thank our annual partners, uh, who are those organizations who stand out as top corporate citizens in Burnaby and support our work throughout the year. You can see them on the screen now. So on the planning uh, level is Burnaby Now, Parkland, SFU, BCAT School of Business and Media, and Douglas College. Uh, the gold level is Electronic Arts, BD, Pacific Blue Cross, and ABC Recycling. And on the silver level is the Port of Vancouver, Appia Development, Alexander College, Scotiabank, TD Bank Group, Blue Myth, Trans Mountain and Fortis BC. So thank you very much. And now we're pleased to get underway with today's session. Um, as we go through today's presentation, if you have any questions, please enter those in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screens. And we'll have a few minutes at the end of the session to answer these questions. So today I'm pleased to be joined by Angie Dasange of Mar Marwick Marketing. Angie is a seasoned marketing professional with over 20 years of industry experience leading and managing strategic marketing initiatives for brands such as BDC, MNP, and PwC. She is the co-owner of Marwick Marketing, a digital agency specializing in search marketing, social media marketing, and website design and development. So Angie, thank you so much for being here. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, okay, I'll just do a share screen here. Okay. All right. Uh, I think I'm visible. Just give me a, a thumbs up or. Yeah, you okay. can see that. Yeah. Excellent. So thanks so much um, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm excited to, to kind of walk you through some practical tips and tools as they relate to search marketing and social media strategies for small business. Um, so first off, oh, I advance my slides here. Um, first off, I just want to share a little bit about Marwick. We've been um, helping small businesses grow through search marketing and social media since 2012. So we're happy to have celebrated our 10 year anniversary this year. Um, we were ranked one of the, the fastest growing companies in BC in 2020. We also hold the premier Google partner agency badge, um, which is the top 3% of agencies across North America. We currently have offices in BC as well as in Cornwall, UK. Um, our team is 22 people strong, primarily based throughout um, the Vancouver and Squamish areas. So um, what I'd like to do today is kind of share with you what we uh, typically see um, when we're working with clients, both on the B2B side as well as B2C. Uh, but I wanted to kick off with getting the basics right first. So if we just go into the agenda here a little bit, um, I want to start off with kind of, you know, taking a step back from the doing and what is it that you really need to do to set the framework and the foundation for any successful marketing strategy, whether it's online or offline. Um, then we'll dive deeper into um, SEO, pay-per-click, which is Google ads, and um, I'll also uh, share with you some insights on social media marketing that hopefully you can have some takeaways from and then we'll wrap it up and, uh, and open up for any questions. So what do I mean when I say know your customer or the basics first? So um, I'd like to introduce this concept of KYC, which is know your client, know your customer. 
So the very first thing you need to do in any marketing strategy or, or uh, any kind of uh, a marketing campaign or business for that matter is determine who are you speaking to? Who's your target audience? And we often overlook this. This is one area actually that you think would be just motherhood kind of statements and, and, and kind of uh, common sense. But oftentimes um, when you're running a business and, and Marwick's guilty of this too, we, we lose sight of who is our ideal customer? There's many different segments that you can be targeting, but if you really hone in on who is your best, most favorite, ideal, perfect customer, that's really who you want to focus on. So how can you do this? It's important to look at some core information for this audience. So what are their demographics? Um, their age, gender, is it primarily male, female, both? What's their average income? Um, also looking at their behavior. So diving into the, their psychographics. What's their lifestyle, their beliefs, their values? Um, there's a really great tool called PRISM, which I can share. Um, I don't have it in this deck here. But that will allow you, uh, it's a database of Canadian households, it will allow you to do searches for psychographic information for different postal codes in different regions and areas throughout Canada. Very useful tool to, to look into this kind of information. Um, where do they live? And how do they consume their information? This is a very important one, especially when we look at topics such as search marketing and social media in particular. Where are they going? This is going to align with their demographics, right? We know that a younger demographic is going to skew more towards popular social media platforms like Snapchat, TikTok, etc. cetera. Um, if we look at the 35 to 55 um, age bracket, Facebook is, the, is where they're consuming their information. So it's very important to know this because that's where you want to be. Um, how do they buy? Are they buying online? Are they more inclined to go in store? Um, is it personal relationships that they're looking for? And which type of content works best for them? Again, aligning back to your social media strategy, your search marketing. So the very first step is really getting a good handle on your target audience. Well, you may be saying, well, I think we have multiple different segments. And that's fine too. So if you're looking at at your business as, uh, as having multiple market segments that you could attract and appeal to, there's just some quick steps here that I wanted to outline. Maybe this is something that you've been thinking about doing in order to um, grow your market share or expand into a different segment, grow your business. So how are you going to do that? So here are just the steps, really, really simple. Identify the needs of your consumer and the customer. Group them based on common characteristics cluster them. And then from there, you want to create meaningful market segments. So you also want to look at the size and the feasibility of each segment. Does it make sense? Are there enough consumers in that market segment? And do they have the ability to buy? Once you've done that, you're going to identify those that you want to then target, looping back to your strategies. And then, of course, you're going to work to take the steps to develop marketing programs for each of those segments. And like anything else, you want to make sure you're monitoring and evaluating your success. Um, one little tool that I have worked with in the past and I, I find very useful in terms of bringing life to your target audience um, is this idea of personas. So this is where you use your research, your demographic, your psychographic information to actually build a um, a fictional character who's actually your ideal customer. So this brings that data that you've compiled, the statistics, the, the demo, the psychographics um, alive. And so this will actually allow uh, your team to really keep focused on who is it we're targeting? What makes them tick? What's a day in the life of this individual or this business? So um, I encourage you to have a look at, at this idea of bringing life to your ideal customer and creating a persona or personas if you have multiple segments um, when looking at your targeting. And it can also help guide your, your strategies in terms of um, your SEO, your PPC, and your social media if you have this as your guiding light and always something to go back to. Um, I believe we do have some uh, B2B businesses on the call today as well or uh, on the presentation. So I just want to take a second to acknowledge that 
the, the targeting process for B2B uh, marketing is a little bit different because you're not in a B2C transaction where you're just looking to, to get in front of the consumer. Typically, when you're in B2B selling or marketing, you have what's called the buying center. And the buying center includes all of the stakeholders that are going to participate in the purchase decision. So this is not something that is going to be fixed or, or formally uh, kind of set out as, as consistent from business to business. It really depends upon uh, a number of different variables, such as the size of the business you're selling to, the industry, um, what are they looking to purchase? So it's important to know who makes up the buying center if you're in the B2B space. So here are just some of the, the questions that you want to be able to answer. Who are the individuals in the buying center? Because ultimately that's who you want to influence. It's also important to know what each of those individuals relative influence is. If you're selling uh, a particularly technical product or service, chances are you're gonna have some very technical individuals involved in that buying center. What's their influence? Who's the decision maker? What would be the buying criteria for each member? Is it technical specifications? Um, is it the bottom line? Is it managing costs? And then you may also have an existing relationship or uh, prior dealings with this, uh, this business that you're selling to. So it's also important to know how each member of that group perceives your organization already, um, your suppliers, your products, services, as well as your team. This is going to help you be successful in any sort of marketing campaign and um, selling process in the B2B space. Um, so real quick on positioning here, um, I've just got a little illustration of a really uh, simple example of a perceptual map uh, for the automotive industry in terms of positioning. So when we talk about positioning, once you've narrowed in on your target audience and you know the segments that you want to get in front of, um, you also wanna look at your positioning. So before embarking on any marketing strategy, you want to determine your product image. What are your product attributes and your pricing? Important to look at this in terms of your competition. So if you were to create a perceptual map for your business, you wanna look at what would be the important variables on those axes. So here using the example of uh, the automotive industry, we have sporty uh, and classic, modern um, and city driving. So in terms of those variables, here's where all of these brands are placed. Try this exercise for your business. It's quite um, enlightening and insightful to see when you actually start to visualize your position on factors that you see as important, perhaps where you need to move the needle or what you can really focus on in terms of your messaging. And this is really going to um, influence and inform your unique selling proposition because at the end of the day, it's all about your value proposition. What do you actually uh, provide to your customers, your consumers, your clients that the competition does not? So having said that, there are ways that you can differentiate from the competition, right? We know that competition is, is fierce in across all industries. So how can you actually stand out from the competition? Perhaps it's on your product, your services, um, the channels that you use. So where you're available for purchase, um, your people, maybe it's how you train your people. Maybe it's the relationships that uh, you have with your clients, as well as your image. So these are intangible benefits of doing business with you. So also important to look at in creating that value proposition aligned with your target audience, how are you going to differentiate yourself and stand out from your competition? So that's sort of setting the framework, okay? It, the marketing 101 type stuff, but very, very important before you embark on any strategy. Without that, the core fundamentals, um, it, your investment, your time, your resources are not being as efficiently and effectively utilized as they should be. So with that in place, then I want to just uh, we'll start off with SEO here. So SEO, search engine optimization. So what exactly is SEO? So we know SEO typically in our day to day uh, world as search engine results. We go into Google, we type something in and, and then you see your results. There's more to it than that. So in SEO, there's three main areas that you need to be concerned with as it relates to your business. 
The first one is rich snippets. And this is uh, basically a convenient summary of information about search results at a glance. These rich snippets are um, that space within an, a, a search that actually gets the highest click-through rate. Why? Well, for one, it's at the top, but more importantly, it's the content of the snippet that's going to get you the click-through. So rich snippets help make your web pages look more enticing and informative in search results. So important to look at this aspect of your SEO strategy. The second one I wanna point out too is just in the center of the slide there called Google My Business. Some of you may already have your Google My Business listing, perhaps some of you don't. This is very important to uh, ensure that you have your Google My Business listing. This helps with your organic SEO but more importantly, it's a free tool that allows you to take control of the way that your business actually appears on Google search and on maps. Um, so you, if, you, if you have not claimed your listing already, if you're not maximizing it, you're leaving uh, premium real estate on the table in terms of SEO uh, and something that's available to you. So the first thing I would do is, is make a note, double check that you have your Google My Business listing, but beyond that, make sure you're optimizing it. So in order to optimize it, there are things that you can do. So when you're setting up your Google My Business listing, upload photos. So you can see in this example here, there's some photos that relate to the business. You can also add a brief description of your business and the category that you're in. Um, special attributes feature, you can also do that. This is also a space where customers can review your business. So one of the ways you can easily increase your, um, your search results, your, your search ranking with Google, is to always respond to those customer reviews as well. So all of this activity, Google will actually see and rank you higher organically just by being able to leverage this free tool that's already accessible to you. So I uh, highly recommend you have a, a, a quick check on that and make sure that you're taking advantage. The next one here that I want to point out is your organic search results or what we call SERP. So SERP is your search engine results page. So this is typically what we look at when we do a search online for, for whatever we're looking for. So this is the, the page that returns after a user submits a search query. So in addition to search results, um, the search engine results page, the SERP, usually includes paid search or PPC ads as well. So you guys are familiar with this. You see the PPC ads up, up, up top, um, and then you see your organic search results. So this is real, these are really the, the three core areas you want to be focusing on for your SEO strategy. Okay, so, but what do you do? How do you ensure that you have SEO success? So at Marwick, we have what's called the seven pillars to SEO success that I want to share with you guys today. So the first one is ensure that you have an agile strategy. There's two main variables that you're uh, reactive to or constantly responding to when it comes to your SEO strategy. That is your competition. So your results, your ranking is going to be directly affected and impacted by what your competition is doing. Right? And the same way your competition is going to be impacted by what you do. So that's the first variable. The second is actually Google itself. So Google has over 200 algorithm updates that they issue every year. Some are announced, some are behind the scenes. That will also impact your ranking. Oftentimes, they'll do mass updates that drop your rankings temporarily. You need to be on that. You need to have an agile strategy to not only be um, uh, reacting or, or um, adapting to what your competition is doing, but also to ensure that Google itself is not having any negative impact on your rankings. Speed is also very important. I'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, in fact, the next few I'll, I'll talk about as we go through. So I just wanted to point out um, the fact that what the two variables that mainly you're up against. So the number one thing with Google is to build trust or, or any search engine for that matter, is to really build trust by providing resources for internet users. 
So what Google is looking to do, Google has crawlers that go through everyone's website and all of the content that's on Google to find the best information or the best resources to serve up to users. So think of it like a gargantuan database or directory. So these crawls are happening. And so the more that Google understands and identifies with your site or your content as being an authoritative source of information to answering queries and questions, that's going to help your ranking and improve your, uh, your trust flow. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So where do you start? So the first thing I would recommend is start with an audit of your website. And when I'm talking about this, also important to make note your website as it appears on desktop, but also on mobile. As we know, the trend towards mobile internet usage is has increased and is actually now surpassing how people use the internet on their desktop. So mobile optimization is also very, very critical, if not um, the most important thing when you're looking at your website. I just noticed all of these are ranked as step one. <laughs> they could be. Um, but no, so your very first step is audit your website. I've provided a, a link here. We have a free audit tool off of our website that I've just embedded the link here for, for you guys to go on and uh, you can go in and enter your URL and it will actually provide a very high level audit of your website. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, show you a screen share of what that'll look like in a second. Second thing you want to do is focus on your keywords. Okay, so I'm sure all of you have heard of your key search terms, your keyword search, and, and what is that? There's different types of keywords, and I'm going to show you what that looks like as well. Um, and then you need to track them over time. SEO is not a one and done activity. As you can maybe start to see here, SEO is something that you invest in. And once you've maintained your ranking, it's something that you need to consistently work at. Um, because as I said, you have those two variables that are uh, that are playing against you. Website load speed is also very important. Um, and then lastly, we have conversion rate optimization. So let me dig into this a little bit more. So when you're looking at um, your site audit, here are some of the things that you want to be looking for. All of these fairly little things can make big changes and big impacts to your search engine ranking. So when we look at on-site internal issues, broken links. So if you have 404 error messages, those indicate broken links. So those are very important to rectify uh, and fix. Do you have good content? So if you're lacking strong content, that's going to also significantly impact your, your ranking. And Google is not going to see you as a, a trusted authority. You may have missing alt tags on images, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, also not using headers, H1, H2, H3 headers. Some of this is getting quite technical in nature. Um, some of this also would require a coding background. So for example, if you're thinking, well, how do I build a rich snippet, for example, you need to have a little bit of coding knowledge. Um, Google does have a number of courses and certifications free of charge that you can go on and complete and, and kind of get a feel for how to do some of these things. Um, but you can also find a, a trusted agency or partner to work with. Perhaps you have someone in-house. So there are ways to work around this if you don't have the technical background in, as a business owner. Um, not maximizing page titles, uh, image file names, meta descriptions, and then externally, who links to your website? We're going to talk about um, backlinks in a second here as well. But links to your website are going to either positively impact your rankings or, or also negatively. So when you do an audit, these are some of the key things you want to look for. Ultimately, with Google and SEO, you want to be able to answer a question. At the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to. And there are multiple ways of doing that. So when you're doing a high-level SEO audit, if you, if you go on, um, online and you use the tool that we have for your free SEO audit, you'll see something that looks like this. So this is basically the um, one of the areas of the report that'll come back to you. So this is just a sample that we had from a, a, a client 
that I've dropped in here. So you can see here that from this audit, the overall score that Google has given this website is 70%. Uh, maybe some of you have already seen this type of a, uh, a review, but typically we like to see businesses in the green, right? So although this one's not in the red, it certainly has a lot of areas to improve. You can see the, the four XX errors. You can see the duplicate me meta descriptions have errors. There's broken internal links, duplicate content. So Google will recognize duplicate content from page to page as well. So it's important to invest in your written content uh, as well as visuals and graphics. And, and I'll show you why in a second. So this would be the first thing that I recommend you do. Um, so I mentioned trust flow and backlinks. It's important to also measure, measure and monitor your business's trust flow. Um, again, I've provided a link here. Um, Majestic is a, another tool that um, you can use free of charge for a very high level look at your business's trust flow. I believe with the free version, you can actually compare to other businesses. So you can do a bit of a, a search against your competition. So you'll see a report that kind of looks like this. You see the competitor, the trust flow, um, backlinks uh, on the, the right-hand side there. So trust flow is a high-level metric that search engines will use to determine how much to trust a website. Um, it takes it into consideration a number of different things. So how long you actually have the domain, so what's the history of the website, the number of backlinks, the speed of your loading page, again, on both mobile as well as desktop. So here's just one of the areas that speed comes in. Google um, really loves a fast website. So the quicker that you can get to uh, the information, the higher Google is going to rank you. So make sure that you're paying attention to your load times, um, security, quality, uniqueness of um, content, et cetera. These are all going to uh, impact your business's trust flow. So where should you be for a small business? We uh, we typically like to see in and around uh, a rank of 20. So this score is quite reasonable and, um, and positive for small businesses. So I've just provided a little guide there at the bottom for you as well. If you're under 10, chances are you're either a new business, new website, or you have some work that can be done on building your trust flow. So looking at all of these uh, criteria uh, can help you do that. So backlinks, I just want to take a minute to talk about backlinks. Backlinks are essentially uh, a third party, a neutral third party that provides a link back to your website. So you see here with this, um, this company's example, um, the, the second business here, Shapara, Shapara Built, has a, a, a strong number of backlinks, uh, as does the second one to, to the end. Um, so important to look at how many backlinks you have. And you may say, well, how do you get backlinks? So one of the ways in which you can obtain backlinks is to provide content. So think about your industry or your business. Are there publications uh, online or sources of information where people might be going? Perhaps it's industry groups or associations that you can provide content to, either by way of blogs or articles how-to lists, um, you know, any kind of checklists are very good, FAQs, all of that. Google loves those types of um, content pieces. So do you have that available? Or who are those platforms in your industry that you can maybe reach out to and provide content to in exchange for a link back to your website? So as you build this, it, it will just help to improve your trust flow and increase your ranking organically as well. Um, so that's essentially how to build your business's trust flow. I want to emphasize here that the little things add up. So although oftentimes a lot of the, um, the tasks to do with SEO are quite technical in nature, there are a lot of little things that you could be doing uh, yourself to really have your ranking add up. So for example, images are also considered content for, for Google. So the way you name images when you're embedding them onto your site is also very important. When you're, when you're adding an image, ensure that you're including some of your most important keywords 
into that file name because Google will actually recognize the file name of an image and use that to rank your website as well. So don't have a generic, you know, numbered file, this, that, for that, you know, use real words, keywords, search terms that you want to rank for and that you want working for you. Okay, important to not um, overlook visuals and images on your website. Also remember on your homepage, what's, what's the, uh, the, the image on your homepage? What's the URL for that? Or what's the name of that file? Okay, your homepage is your most valuable real estate. That is the page that Google will go to first and foremost. So make sure you're optimizing your homepage to the best of your ability. Um, okay, so next I wanna look at um, tier one, tier two and long tail keywords. So when looking at these, it's important to find search volumes for each of these tiers. There's a number of tools that you can use uh, as well. So Google has a number of free tools for keyword search volume. Um, or also within Google Ads. Create a spreadsheet, keep track of these. So your tier one keywords are gonna be your highest competition, highest search volume, but quite general, as you can see from this example. But where you wanna embed your tier one keywords is in the home page or what we call evergreen pages. Evergreen pages are where the content isn't seasonal or trending or transitory. So it's, it's pretty consistent. Um, from time, from uh, historically through uh, through the year, your tier two again, you're getting more granular now. You have lower search volume but less competition. Okay, so important to look at those as well. This is uh, where you would find these are typically product pages or landing pages, and then you have what we call long tail keywords, which are medium search volume but far less competition. So here's where you can, um, you can answer a question, you can provide blogs or articles. Uh, it's basically starting at the top of funnel. So again, where would you have those FAQ page blogs and articles? Um, again, this is just another tool, answerthepublic.com. So this website here um, is a database uh, from search engines that provides a bit of a roadmap for content planning. So you can enter in um, your industry or your product and it will actually give you uh, consumer insights to help you create fresh, useful content product services. So take a minute and have a look at this tool based on whatever it is that you, you know, that's relevant to your business and what people would be searching for. And it's a neat little tool there. Um, so I'm just being mindful of time here. Feed, again, we've talked about that. Speed of your, your load speed is very important. It's one of the core web vitals that Google focuses on. Have a look, uh, you know, you can put your website through some of the tools that I've provided here as well. So you can test your website load time. Um, but again, keep in mind that it's important to look at that for both mobile as well as desktop. And conversion rate optimization. This is an area that oftentimes gets overlooked, uh, unfortunately, and it's one of the, the most important. So you get users, you get visitors to your website, but then what? It's important to take that traffic and turn them into, into customers. Ultimately, that's, that's why we're all here. So how do you do this? Ensure that you have a strong call to action, okay? One call to action is what you wanna have on your, your website or your landing page. Do A-B testing. So in, in both, PPC, SEO, as well as Facebook or social media advertising, A-B testing is highly important because it allows you to, to try multiple call to actions, multiple visuals, messaging, taglines, and see which one is actually resonating with your audience. Again, going back to the basics. And once you know that, you can double down on those that are delivering you more results, right? Get to know your customers. Um, so that's extremely important part of the process. Um, so now I wanna shift gears to Google Ads. So Google Ads is essentially the, the, the pay to play version of SEO. So this is where you're setting a budget and you're, you're taking advantage of Google's pay-per-click uh, advertising platform. So there's a couple things to, to kind of note here. I'm just gonna go back for a sec. So, if you're thinking, well, you know, we, we have an SEO strategy or we haven't done an SEO strategy before, what about Google Ads? Could we do this? 
So there's a number of different ways to to kind of tackle this or, or approach these these um, channels or these these vehicles. So if you've never done SEO before, trust that it's going to take time to get your ranking. Typically, six to eight months is what we recommend in terms of give it six to eight months to really see some good, positive, strong results. Where PPC comes in is uh, a bit of a different strategy. Is if you haven't had an SEO strategy you may decide to do some pay-per-click to generate immediate sales because with your bidding and your targeting, you're going to start to appear at the top of the page while you build up your organic SEO. Ultimately, you want your organic SEO to outperform your pay-per-click, right? Because at the end of the day, budgets are limited and we don't want to be in the the pay-to-play game for too long or unnecessarily. So you want your organic to be strong but that does take time. So you can use a pay-per-click strategy um, to generate immediate sales, to get top rankings uh, and kind of have a a combined strategy that way. So I'm not gonna focus on on all of these uh, these 10 areas um, that we see as common uh, mistakes, but this was an interesting survey that was done by MyZone Media. Um, And we see this typically with, uh, with businesses all the time as well. So I'm just going to focus on on a few of these. But one of the things that we see, which is a critical step to assessing your actual success with your Google Ads campaign, is your conversion rate tracking. So uh, oftentimes we see businesses will come to us and they haven't actually set up their conversion rate tracking at all. So they don't really know what's working. Very important to properly set up your conversion rate tracking. So what are you actually measuring? Are you measuring your cost for acquisition? Are you measuring your return on ad spend, which is ROAS here? Um, And also make sure you're tracking all of your conversion types. So you may have leads that come into your website via web forms. Make sure you're tracking those. You may have e-commerce sales. You may have phone calls. You may have uh, other channels that are actually generating conversions and leads make sure your conversion tracking includes all of those different types. And how are you looking at that? Another, I want to point out to number five, another key metric to look at is what we call attribution modeling. If you're using more than one platform or channel, so let's say you have a organic SEO strategy, you have your Google ads, you have social media, you you can rest assured that your customers are are having multiple touch points with you through those channels before actually converting to a purchase or a customer transaction. So it's important to know what that customer journey is. That's what we call attribution modeling. An attribution model essentially lays out the journey that a a customer or client has taken before they actually made the purchase. So did they come in via um, a direct search first? Then they clicked on one of your Facebook ads. Then they came in through uh, an organic um, search or uh, they clicked on a PPC ad. So attribution modeling actually shows you that journey and uh, informs you on what's working and what's not. So very important to set these things up. Um, Bidding strategies, pretty straightforward stuff, just not getting your bidding strategy right. What are you maximizing? Are you maximizing clicks? Google will oftentimes suggest you increase your budget because you could you could generate uh, more impressions. Well, great. But what what is your strategy? And maybe that's not the best use of your uh, of your budget. So important to look at your bidding strategy. Branded keywords. So branded keywords are keywords that actually relate to your business. It could be the business name. It could be um, your product category specifically. But they're essentially branded keywords are directly associated with your brand, your products, your services. It's important to invest in branded keywords because it directly influences your brand's presentation in your SERP results. Remember, we talked about SERP results. Um, one other point here I want to I want to note is this is space where you control the messaging and you are able to um, essentially determine how the user sees your your brand. It's also important if individuals are searching your brand in particular, you want to show up in a top ranked spot because these consumers, these customers are interested in 
your brand, your product, they're ripe for purchasing. And so if you're not investing in your branded keywords, you may not be ranking. You may actually have a, a competitor showing up because what they've done is they've adopted a competitor keyword strategy. That's the last thing you want to have happen. So have a look at how you're leveraging and optimizing your branded keywords. The third point there, don't forget typos. Think about your company name, okay? If you have um, some unique uh, spelling mistakes that can occur or frequent mistypes of your company name, include that in your branded keyword strategy, okay? Important to do that. Um, competitive keywords. So from our experience, competitor clicks uh, typically are five to 25 times more expensive than your own branded clicks. But it's important to include competitor keywords in your SEO strategy as well. So these are the keywords that your competitors are currently targeting to improve their rankings and to generate more traffic. So targeting keywords that your competitors are targeting also helps you appear on the same SERPs as your competition. Okay, you wanna be there. So you wanna be where your competition is showing up. Um, so important to look at that and, and see what you're doing with your competitive keywords as well. Um, again, missing or, or bad keywords, um, use the, the Google Keywords Planner. This will help you to identify keywords that you may not necessarily think of as being commonly used to search for your product, your service, or to answer a question related to. Also, if you have a business that is seasonal in nature, remember to consider and think about those seasonal keywords and use those at the right time. Okay, so one way to do this is to actually create an Excel uh, database of your keyword strategy, including the seasonal keywords. Make sure you're staying on top of it and you're keeping it refreshed uh, and, uh, and updated as you go. Um, negative keywords as well. So these are keywords that you want to exclude from your search term. So um, an example of this is, let's say you have an optometrist who sells eyeglasses. A negative keyword search term could be wine glasses, drinking glasses, um, glass for house, anything like that, that has similar keywords, but not quite related to the business. So it's important to also look at your negative keywords so that you're not wasting your budget. Um, so you're not having um, your ad groups performing uh, negatively. Also geo-specific negative. So if, you're, if you wanna exclude a particular um, geographic location, this is the area to do that as well. So important to do this so you're, you're not um, consuming your budget on, on things that aren't necessary. Um, audience exclusions, here is where you can also use uh, Google tools to define the type of audience that you want to have your ads show up for. Um, so this is also very important for remarketing. The one thing I want to actually mention here with Google is that some of you may have already heard that uh, Google is working on eliminating third party cookies. And I want to just talk about that for a second as it relates to remarketing. So in the absence of third-party cookies, so that's basically where you get the, the pop-up box when you go to a website, it says we're tracking cookies, you say yes, off you go, perhaps you block them. This is tracking user behavior from site to site. So if you are effectively doing a remarketing strategy using Google, you have access to that data. You're able to remarket to your target audience based on their third-party cookie data that they're obtaining. So Google's in the process due to privacy issues and concerns and, and uh, consumers voicing their, their thoughts on, on privacy issues around that. They, are, they, they were looking to actually eliminate third-party cookies this spring, but the solution that they're trying to come up with to, uh, to provide an alternative to that um, didn't quite work out the way they wanted. So now they've extended this transition away from third-party cookies to 2024. But what does that mean for your business? So to this point, we don't know what they're gonna replace third-party cookies with. Nobody knows. They're working on developing cohorts or uh, groups based on certain behaviors, but we won't have that individual tracking data anymore. So 
the way you are using your first party cookies, which is traffic directly to your website, is going to become even more important and critical. So again, what does this mean? Your on-site experience, how you're leveraging and optimizing traffic that does come to your website is going to become more and more relevant and important. So have a look at your website between now and 2024. Have a look to see what improvements you can make. How are you capturing data when people come to your site? Um, do you have sign-up forms for, for something? Do you offer promotions? How can you capture their unique IP addresses to be able to uh, effectively and, and properly remarket to them? So just, just a note to, to make of that, to, to know that this change will be coming um, and how to be prepared for it and start thinking about that now. The number one um, mistake that we actually see is poor landing page experience. So you've set up your campaign, you have traffic coming to the site, but when people arrive, you have a poor landing page experience. So this is where perhaps your call to action is not clear. Again, load times on the site. Perhaps you have too much content. So on a landing page, the goal here is to have one call to action. Competing call to actions actually create more confusion among visitors. So according to research that's been done, it shows that landing pages that uh, had one call to action link actually led to an average conversion rate of 13.5%, while pages with two to four call to actions led to an average conversion of 11.9, and any landing page that had five or more call to actions, conversions actually dropped to lower than 10%. So stick with one call to action. This is where your testing is going to come in handy. Have two landing pages. If you have a particular campaign or a seasonal campaign, create two landing pages that you're driving all of your campaigns to and see which one is performing better. That's going to guide where you should be doubling down on. Improve your page load speed. Again, um, I can't tell you how many visits have been uh, aborted or abandoned because of page load times being too slow. Make your landing page visually interesting. So your landing page is not where you want to be content heavy. Make it appealing, make it easy to navigate. Um, so keep in mind that you want to have, you want to be able to spice it up, but also don't overdo it. Keep it simple, clean, um, and then optimize your landing page for mobile as well. Very important. Um, and, and keeping in mind, you want to reduce the text on your landing page because this is where you're actually, um, it's your lead generation page. It's your, uh, it's the page that you're driving people to specifically from a campaign. Um, okay, so lastly here, just spending a couple minutes on social media. So why social? So we know that social media is a very popular tool for, uh, for users to use in terms of engaging with brands and businesses. But more and more individuals, the younger demographic, are actually using social media for search. So this is a growing trend that you want to pay attention to. So Google is not the only search engine anymore. You, you also see um, massive search volume traffic occurring through social media channels, YouTube, Facebook, um, et cetera. So think about this. LinkedIn, if you're in B2B space, LinkedIn is a, uh, a very important social media channel that you should be leveraging. So just here, I wanted to show you uh, all of the various channels and how they perform by audience reach. So think about your business. Think about your audience, their demographics. Which platforms make the most sense for you to be spending your time, your energy, your, your budgets on? Okay, YouTube, very, very popular. YouTube is great for video and again for search. Huge, huge search volume here. Um, so think about that as well. Your own YouTube channel. Be optimizing your own YouTube channel. What do you have for your own content? It's not just about advertising. I do want to point out, though, that all of these platforms have unique and, and varying um, groups that they target or that their users are made up of. So I just wanted to provide this little visual here um, just to give you a little snapshot. This this data and, and, and deeper data is available online. You can do searches for the best channels to use based on your demographic. But I just wanted to provide this little snippet so you can start to think, where is your audience? Is your audience 25 to 34? OK, well, you should be using Facebook. Um, you know, we see with Pinterest, 50 percent of new signups are men. OK, interesting. 
Where are the largest opportunities? Are you in the home space, parenting, food? So you can start to see where you should be plugging in your social media strategy and what makes the most sense. So how, how can you actually use social? It depends on your business. Okay, if you can use social for direct sales, it's an amazing tool to generate direct sales from. You can also just have a presence. Um, that What that means is it's more about engaging with your customers, your consumers, having your brand visible. For a lot of small businesses, it's just about being there. So how you use social really depends upon your business and uh, to the extent at which you can leverage it for directing sales and, and building community, essentially. Uh, okay. And so lastly, I just want to provide here, if you're thinking about developing a social media strategy or you already have one, here are some of the questions that can help guide you in terms of developing your social media programs. So again, coming back to your target audience. Who uses uh, these channels? What's driving engagement? What type of content is suitable for your brand? Okay, so think about these questions. Do you have specific daily, weekly targets of how active you want to be on, on social media? Are you happy with just having a presence? The, the number one thing that we see or the, the, the obstacle for business owners with social media is time. A lot of business owners will just say, I don't have the time for this. Not everybody has an in-house resource. Again, think about that. What is it that you want to achieve? If it's just about having a presence, perhaps it's something that, you, again, you can uh, engage with a trusted agency or firm who handles social media and have them just keep things uh, kind of strumming along for you. If you're looking for a more in-depth strategy, again, something that perhaps you need to, to think about and look at. But always monitor, measure, and evaluate. Um, so to, to just wrap up here, um, again, these are just some of the metrics that you can also consider when uh, looking at your social media strategy. There's a number of different metrics that perhaps uh, could be goals or objectives for your business. Um, but again, to wrap it up, very important. Start with the end in mind. Okay, Not only from who is your ideal customer, where do you want to grow your business? What's the, the best avenue for you to go? What are your business's goals and objectives? Number three, I want to stress this. Start slow and grow, okay? If, you, if you're if you just starting this process or you have done some of this before, but you know there's areas that you can improve, start with one area at a time. Start with, you know, if you have no SEO presence, maybe you want to start with a bit of a PPC strategy while you build up your SEO. Maybe then you, um, you know, you, you implement a social media, but pick the lowest hanging fruit and start there. Test, 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 test. Try different campaigns. Both your organic and your paid search marketing takes time to, to get hold and to really start. Um, the data takes time to gather, which is going to give you great insights in terms of where you need to take your ad campaigns and your, your marketing strategy next. So that's also start slow. Don't jump in uh, you know, with, with everything you got. Take it slow, one step at a time, and grow from there and stick with it. We see this happen all the time in the industry where business owners will, will come out of the gate, guns are blazing, and within a couple months, they're not seeing the results and, and they decide to pull the pin. This stuff takes time and it's not something that's a one and done. Decide where you want to invest, focus your efforts, your budget. We don't have unlimited budgets. We know all that. So do that, um, that research up front. What's going to make the most sense for you? Start there, but stick with it. Give it time. Stay the course. Um, and essentially, that's that's uh, what I'd like to wrap with. So um, time for questions. So I see there's one here. Uh, yeah. So what is a good speed for loading my homepage? Is there any tool to test it? Um, yeah. So Diana, there is a tool I provided in the, uh, it's the Web Vitals link on one of the previous slides. Ultimately, the faster, the better. Um, if you're within within three seconds, two, three seconds, your page should be loaded. Um, the faster, the better. But use that tool to, to test and see. Um, what can you suggest for intangible products marketing I'm in the insurance industry? Okay, um, so good question. So um, are you selling insurance for consumers or, or B2B? Um, can you, 
or even just maybe put yourself off mute. I don't know if we can do that. Um, so, so it really depends, yeah, consumers. Okay, so I would really recommend um, a strong search strategy for you, um, as well as networking. So think about, um, you know, depending on the type of insurance that you sell as well, um, you may want to look at social media channels like, you know, Facebook, um, definitely leaning more towards that, that older demographic, I would assume. Um, LinkedIn, if you're typically, again, think about your target audience. Who's your ideal customer? Are you selling insurance to more professionals or is that kind of the niche you want to cater to? Um, so think about your audience, but, um, you know, professional services marketing, it's kind of, uh, it's a beast in and of itself. I'm happy, like I said, um, on this slide here, I'm happy to have a, a chat offline if you'd like and, and share some thoughts on that because it has a bit of a, a different spin to it. Um, so I hope that gives you some, but feel free to reach out and we can chat more on that. I'm happy to, to do that. Um, Thanks again, Angie, and thank you all for joining us today. And we hope to see you soon. Have a good rest you. of your day.